Welcome to Galactic Grandmother Heart to Heart. My name is April and my special returning guest today is Jen Sullivan. Jen um, wrote uh, her first book, which I, I did, Child of the Universe. We did an interview about that book, which I will link below. And um, her full bio is in there, but I just will say, Jen, she is an international journalist. She has two masters. She's a teach former teacher. And now she lives with her family in Hawaii, um, mm -hmm. homesteading it. So she's a brave woman. <laughs> yeah. And um, she has written another book, which I couldn't wait to get her back on. Let me see, I have a little bookmark in there. Ooh. The Gift of the Stars. And another fascinating um, past life story. So welcome, Jen. I'm so happy to be able to talk to you about this new book. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me come back and for reading my book as well. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Oh, I love it. I love it. Um, can you just give our um, audience a little bit of a background of how this book, The Gift of the Stars, really um, is a follow-up in a way to Child of the Universe with Christy. Definitely. Well, uh, in my first book, I wrote a book called Child of the Universe, um, and I published it in 2020 at the end of 2020. And it was a culmination of a bunch of hypnosis sessions that I had incurred with the hypnotist Sarah Breskman Cosme. And we had done a bunch of hypnosis for about three years, almost three years worth of sessions. And during the sessions, we uncovered a lot of information about my past lives. And the, the most important one I thought I had discovered at that time was the one of my past life in Atlantis and in Lemuria and being a part of the matriarchal family of Lemuria and being taken uh -huh. a prisoner in Atlantis. And I wrote all about that in my first book. I, I came to Hawaii and I started having these strange dreams of another past life that I had, that oh. I had discovered with Sarah. And if anyone's familiar with Sarah Breskin Cosme's book, she writes about this past life also about the life of Christy from the 1970s in her uh, first, and I think her second book a little bit. So I had a past life. My name was Christy. It was the lifetime right before this lifetime. And I was a young woman who lived in New York City. And I came from a single family, like a single mother family. And it was a very... <sighs> just it wasn't a typical upbringing that I had but it was um kind of uh, empowering in many ways because it taught me to depend on myself and when I was a little bit older I started doing hypnosis sessions in this past life um, as Christy and through these hypnosis sessions I remembered my past lives that I wrote about in my first book yeah. so it's a little bit of like a past life within a past life scenario a little bit of a, a quantum you know throwback there but Christy understood her past life and she understood that she needed to explain this kind of stuff to people but when she tried explaining it to people she was thrown into like a mental institution and kept there without any kind of any kind of you know proper thorough check or you know just to it, it was just silencing someone at that time and it was very easy to do especially to women you just blamed it on you know hysterical female hormones or whatever they felt like blaming it on at that moment so mm -hmm. christy spent quite a bit of uh time not a lot but a, a bit of time in uh, what you would call like you know just a a, a mental institution a, a, a psychiatric ward and during that time she deals with a doctor that was not very helpful. He was very much into finding out more about these powers that we talked about in the first and the second books, but wasn't interested in helping anyone. And unfortunately, it, you know, it just kind of spirals out of control and leaves Christy in a place where she really doesn't have any choice but to kind of end that life and allow me to begin this life, the life that I'm living now. Mm -hmm. And that was all stuff I uncovered in my hypnosis sessions. And I decided to write about it because I thought if it helped me, it was possible it could help other people to read it. And that has actually been the case so far. So <laughs> I'm glad I did it. So um, just to 
recap with a couple of things. You said that in this current life, you had actually had dreams about Christy. Is that right? Definitely. And they were very strong when I first came to live here in Hawaii. And I couldn't understand why I was dreaming of this like New York City 1970s house. It was more of like an apartment, but like a row house in, in what you'd see in one of the boroughs of New York City. And I kept dreaming every night over and over again. And I'm like, what is going on? And it's funny, I used to dream all the time of the wave, the wave that I wrote about in the first book, the wave that crushes Amun, Lemuria, whatever you want to call that Pacific continent that's been lost under the sea. And after I wrote the book, I, I really have not had that dream very often, to be honest, not as, as often as I used to. So I've realized my dreams are kind of telling me to write about things. And if I don't write about them, they're just going to keep agitating me in my, <laughs> in my sleep to get this work done. So that was kind of my instinct was I needed to write Christie's story. And once I did write it, my dreams have changed since then. So awesome. Yeah. Um, the, I mean, poor Christy, she um, didn't have the greatest childhood and upbringing. And mm -hmm. then um, when she's just getting her freedom and, and being, uh, somewhat independent and working then she gets thrown into that mental institution and mm -hmm. um, receive treatments that are pretty much outlawed today I don't think they do lobotomies anymore but we hope they're outlawed at this point you know right with the electroshock therapy and you had received that as well yes and, um what really caught my attention when you were talking about after the lobotomy, you had said, I'm going to refer to the book, that it really scrambled your brain, your mm -hmm. human brain about that current life is Christy. Yes. But within your consciousness um, was the memory of uh, Kala. Yes. And and that that energy, that consciousness from that previous lifetime had not been scrambled and became even stronger. You felt the rage from that lifetime as well. Um, would you like to talk more about that? I thought that was fascinating. Yeah. Definitely. I felt that it was probably in one of my earliest sessions I ever had with Sarah Breskman Cosme was talking uh, the, the idea, the concept of what Christy went through started crossing through in my sessions. And at first it was very overwhelming to understand this about myself. Like, I just want to make the distinction in this lifetime, you know, not that there, there, there should be anything shameful about what that is to undertake, but I've never been in a mental institution. I've never been committed but for me to have these weird memories and this like for it to come through in my sessions, I didn't know where it was coming from, but there was a lot of anger behind this lifetime because it was cut yeah. short. Very, it, it was a very traumatic lifetime, but I think it's also a lifetime right. a lot of women can relate to in many ways, even now, you know, what people have had to go through in order to get the basic rights that we've achieved at this point is unbelievable. Yeah. And if you look back just 40 years, it's like, what what were we what what couldn't be done to a woman at that point truly right, right. So the lifetime you wanted to know though about crisscrossing a little bit with Kala so in in this sub uh, book I talk a little bit about the doctor giving me electroshock therapy uh -huh. and it requires my brain in this in this lifetime where it scrambles it enough where I'm I'm having trouble remembering my current lifetime but I can now have the ability to recall my past lifetimes very clearly Mm -hmm. And it just opens that outlet up and it allows for that energy to kind of guide me in a way of to try to save myself using Kala's energy to guide me out of this scenario. But it guides me out of it and it brings me to a peaceful place, but it's not the happy ending you watch in a Disney film. I, I just thought that was fascinating, though, how um, when one consciousness of yeah. Christy in that lifetime was jumbled then another consciousness was able to come in and um really to the rescue yeah just to kind of give her i feel it's almost like mercy at, at a point like that just to not be as physically or mentally present for that kind of abuse or that kind of you know torture to be done to a person you almost find solace in going to a different part of your your record a different part of who you were once before to get you through something and 
I think that's an excellent place to draw power from in some ways, you know, there are some lifetimes you do want to draw from and you know that that's a good thing to pull from. So, and through quantum entanglement, we're always connected to those previous lifetimes. Now, your childhood friend, Danny, that had red crystal. Yes. um, The pendant, I believe. Wasn't that um, a synchronicity or, you know, that was just such a coincidence that she suddenly shows up in the mental hospital again with you. And of course, then the doctor um, gets that crystal and he thought he was going to be helping Danny with it, but he kind of became obsessed with it. Definitely. Did you feel like he was believing that it had power, but he couldn't figure it out? Or what What were his thoughts? I completely relate to that concept of him going into it, looking to help someone, but the power overtaking him, the power being too strong for him to even deny. There is something within it that I feel it, it could, you know, it, it changes a person if you want that kind of power it removes that filter that we have that kind of tells us, no, you know, leave, leave good enough alone, go beyond and go for it. And it's that, I think, conquering mentality that we really need to start putting aside. And you see the damage it does to this young woman in that lifetime. It really is not something that helps her, either one of them to, you know, the doctor's help there. So. Another really intriguing overlap between this life time and Christie's lifetime was you started your you were a child in New York City yes just like Christy and then you were out for a walk with your mother and yes. you saw Christie's mother sitting on a step smoking and your your eyes locked with her mm-hmm. and there was a recognition that was blew my mind Definitely. That was from one of my earlier sessions with Sarah too. A lot of it was kind of like piecing a puzzle together and and trying to understand it in that manner. But very, very, very powerfully in my mind, I have this memory from being a young child in a small stroller with a specific little hoodie sweatshirt on. And I remember my mother walking me or my mother worked in Wall Street at the Federal Reserve. And um, I remember seeing the George Washington statue. The woman was sitting in front of it across the street from Wall, Wall Street. And it was, uh, it was kind of one of those quantum entanglement moments where, you know, you, you recognize each other from that lifetime. You know, the bond between a mother and a child is a very powerful bond. Right, and right. no matter what passes through that lifetime, no matter what kind of upset or disappointment takes place between those two souls, there's something there that's forever. And I think that's what I recognized in that, in, in that, and it gave her the peace to kind of move on with her life. And it gave me the peace to move on with this life and to put that behind us. And I think when you're little, you're very susceptible to what you were. It goes away, I think, as we grow right. and get older yeah. and we be more conditioned to society. Yeah. Of course, you know, you, you want to fit in, stay in the mainstream and your brain changes to only see what we see here. So that was definitely something I wanted included in there because I felt like you needed to have, you have to have peace with people when you go. You can't keep that kind of anger going into your next lifetime because it will affect it. Yeah, that um, that was quite mind blowing when I read that part. And just as in Child of the Universe, you had mentioned a previous lifetime um, being the, the man from outer space. Yes, the commander. Yeah, that came to Earth. In this book, in The Gift of the Stars, as Christy, towards the end there, you have, it seems, a flashback. Yes. Perhaps being a Hopi Indian in the um, caverns when they were in there during the Great Ice Age, or I believe it was. Can you talk about that? Yes. When I talk about the commander in the second book, I believe Christy is cha- like channeling the commander for a group of people. Uh, she has been doing some hypnosis sessions with a woman who is kind of new into hypnosis and is just figuring things out, but she's looking for this, this power that she recognizes. And 
um, the commanders channeled and he gives them this whole insight about the red crystal talking about what the red crystal did to his planet, the advancements it gave them, the ability to travel, like interstellar travel, the ability to have immunity. It, it evolved their species, but the way they were obtaining these red crystals was through a forced slave labor. So even before the, we had our colonization of this, this earth, of this planet, we came to this planet with a previous history of something that was very negative and very shameful to our species. And it carried its messages in these red crystals. And I talk a lot about the red crystals in the first and second book, because I believe they're a very powerful undercurrent to our world. It's a lot of the things that we're trying to still figure out. And how did it happen? Well, you know, crystal is something it powers our cell phones. We're looking at time crystals now. It's, it's something we're still understanding of how they work so if you're into <laughs> the undying power of crystals i would highly recommend checking these books out because i talk about them in a way that i feel um i feel compelled almost to talk about them even though i'm not a big crystal person just because of how prevalent they are in my past life regression sessions and oh. others as well others have uh contacted me about theirs and and the same thing so i think it's uh something worth looking at but. Yeah, and in my past lifetime in Atlantis, that was a common commonality that we had, that I was aware of the red crystals and their destructive nature as well from that lifetime. Exactly. So I mean, you know. good and bad, you know. Good and bad, very much. And in the gift of the stars, though, when um, Christy has that flashback to being the man in the cave system. Yes, with him. That was another past life that I, I regressed with Sarah as well. And it was through the lifetime of Christy that we kind of came to understand him. And it was um, our, our people. So all of my past lives, I feel like have a DNA connection as well as a spiritual connection through your metaphysical DNA, your Akashic record, whatever you want to call it. Right. I believe that they're multifaceted in that way. So every past lifetime that I talk about in my books that I feel, you know, we, we can connect to each other because we're all part of that same continuum. And with this uh, man who was in the cave systems, I wrote about it. Um, Christy channeled him and understood that this past life happened right as the ice age had ended. And I felt like it took place in some place on the coast of California, perhaps central California is what it kind of felt like in the sessions. And we had just cut, started coming out of the caves. We weren't sure if we wanted to leave the caves. We had gone there for safety during right. the ice age. We had been warned to build them before the ice age by our star, you know, our star elders, our star advisors. And right. um, I talk about the lifetime of us finally leaving the caves and what that was like for us to go back to living outside after we had adapted to living inside. And I felt it was such a powerful lifetime to connect to now, to who I currently am, because I feel that same, as I, I talked about how, when you come out of that lifetime, um, I was standing on this cliff watching my children play in the warm, you know, the cold plastic Pacific, Pacific uh, the Pacific water, <laughs> uh -huh. get that word out. And I, I feel that same sense of like calmness, that kind of you, you've gone through something and now you've escaped out into another place. And this is where you were supposed to be, but you had to go through much internally as well as externally to get there. And I feel that energy from that lifetime as well very much in this one resonating and I think Christy did too and it gave her the ability to to put an end to her suffering in a way that she felt gave her the power to call the shots for once in her life awesome now um will there be a follow-up continuum <laughs> of the the past lives here? Oh, definitely. Definitely. I'm actually working actively right now on my third book. And this book goes a little bit, um, it, it will be very much like, uh, it, it's a continuum to the first two books, but it's not going to deal with Christy or Kala. Um, I'm still in the process of figuring out what her name was, but I'll tell you about the, where the story came from. So I gave birth to my fourth child while I was doing sessions with Sarah. I was pregnant during a lot of my sessions. So it was a very interesting concept to have like a fetus growing within you while you're doing all this quantum work. So right. 
that was one thing I came, I, I went to the hospital. I had to have a C-section for my baby and I was having a lot of trouble healing after the C-section. I came home. I had a newborn. I had three other children. I was doing way too much. And I had an accident where my, my C-section actually reopened after I came home and I could not, I was, I just was, you know, I was in a place where I didn't know what I was going to do. So I asked Sarah, could you please come to my house? I can't leave. I can't move. Can you do a session with me? And maybe we can see if we can heal this before I have to like go back to the hospital because I just don't want to go back there at this point. Yeah. So she came over and as she came over, this torrential downpour came down and I'm not joking, almost two feet of rain fell on my, like my house. She had Whoa. a weight, weighed through my front lawn to get to my house with her laptop all wrapped up. And she came in and did this session. And my past life that the session brought me to was one in ancient Sumer in Sumeria. And I was a young woman who was the daughter of the chief of, of this early, early grouping of Sumerians, very early, like before we had like a ziggurat there at that point or anything, we were a very large group of people. And we had been told oh, our entire oh, lives. Mm -hmm. A ziggurat. A ziggurat, yeah. What so like an ancient, uh, ancient step pyramids that appear in Sumer in uh, all of Babylon and all of the uh, Mesopotamian area. Those were the original platforms they built uh, to worship their gods and okay. communicate with their gods. Okay. Or you know, like a landing pad for their gods too, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry to yeah. interrupt. No worries. I love, like, you know, what? I, I never know, like, what I need to explain. So it's always good to let me know. And in this lifetime, um, what we regressed to while I was in this state was that the, I was waiting for the, this, the, these men came to our village, but they weren't men, they were humanoid ish beings. They were way taller than anyone else of us. Our, our families had only left the caves a couple of generations before that from the, uh, the ice age. And we were living in this Mesopotamian area. And these men came from outer space and demanded the women of our village to impregnate them. And this huge battle ensues and I'm caught in the middle of it almost everyone there is killed. These people, well, these humanoid beings kind of put me in hiding for the rest of my, not the rest of my life, but for a good portion of my life until I'm able to kind of get to a point where I'm in control of this town and we're able to trap and, and just kind of get rid of these aliens. And <laughs> I couldn't understand. I was like, what is this about? What is going on in this? But you know what? We ended the session. I didn't really understand what it was supposed to do, except tell me it's been worse than this. You'll recover. You'll be fine. So I took it as that. And of course the session ended. And a couple of days later, I was fine. Everything was healing. And from then on everything, like my body started going back to the way it should have been, you know, not <laughs> like it was there. So were you impregnated by the the um, outer space people? So here's the thing. I did decide I left it like on a shelf and I said, I don't even I don't even need to know what that stuff is now. I got to worry about Kala and now I got to worry about Christy. But as soon as I, I finished Christy's book and I put it out, guess what my dreams started to become? Oh my gosh. Yes, it was that lifetime. So I re-listened to my sessions. I listened to that whole thing and I said, oh my God, this is this is actually part of this whole continuum. It's not just this weird one-off thing. This is a part of the whole story. So now I'm doing it. I'm breaking it all down. I'm figuring it all out. I'm putting the pieces together and then I'm going to write it just like I wrote the first two books. And it's going to be this continued story of emerging from after the ice age, but um, a couple of generations after they first come out and what happens when these humanoid, these aliens come back and they come looking for us and they want us to be their, their vessels of children and, and our slave labor for everyone. And it's what happens when we say no, when we stand up for ourselves as a species and we say, we're not doing that anymore. Wow. Yes. Oh my gosh. This is just awesome. And you know, what's so great is this is, um, real life. I mean, this is from your Akashic records and it's the real deal. And I love the fact that you're able to um, bring people into um, the mindset that we've had all these previous lifetimes and that 
they not only um, impact who we are today, but there's a, a thread running through them, which is our, our basic consciousness of who we are. That's correct. A hundred percent. It's amazing. All these fun experiences. <laughs> Truly. And this wasn't something I was very like into or interested in before I started doing my sessions. My sessions were just done by chance. I wasn't even looking to have them done before all of this. I was very scientifically based. I was a journalist. I needed facts. I needed to see evidence. I needed to have two sources. And now I kind of have realized that a lot of the things that we've taken on and we've become conditioned to in this world are more of an a way to keep us disempowered it's a way to keep us disconnected it's a way to keep us working and not questioning anything and i just don't want to be a part of that at all and i've realized that there's way more freedom and happiness and just discovering who you are discovering who you've been kind of brainwashed to forget about and seeing how that plays out for myself in the future having that awareness within me and and as you incorporate those um, other aspects as you become aware of who you really are it really does empower you with a, um, a, a much higher um, consciousness I believe I mean I I'm seeing you and you're just beaming full of all this great positive energy and that's got to be wonderful for your children being a mother Oh, totally. You become way more in tune to their happiness and not just making them happy with things, but truly being present for them, experiencing those moments with them and, and just having all of that. It's, it's much better. <laughs> it's way better than I, you know, what I used to do with myself. I feel like I used to just kind of struggle to get by and that it was very difficult to feel that kind of connection with my children because I was always focused on paying the mortgage, getting the electricity taken care of and in, in kind of changing the way I, I run my life now in moving and creating a homestead and living off grid. I've removed a lot of the stress I didn't need to have in my life. And I can focus more or less on the present, but also I can focus on the past in a, in a special way too. You know, I can start looking at all those connections and seeing how they work out in my life here. I love it. Now uh, to get totally off topic, go ahead. I find it fascinating that you um, completely you moved from the Florida Keys, correct? Yeah. And you're homesteading in Hawaii. Now, how did that come about? Wow. Well, it, it definitely, it, it was a process. So it all started truly in 2017 when our house was and prop everything was destroyed in a big hurricane that hit the Florida Keys. We lost our home, our businesses, our cars, everything we owned. All we had was like wow. the clothes on our backs. And that was pretty much it. And we realized once we finished rebuilding our house and once everything was done and said, and it was a long, arduous, stressful, bullshit process, to be honest, the whole thing, mm -hmm. we realized we had this brand new, beautiful house, everything we'd ever wanted. And we were, we were scared to live there. We just didn't want to be there anymore. We didn't feel like we resonated with it. And it was just, we saw so many signs happening around us that just told us like, this is not where you need to be anymore. So we sat down and we talked a little bit about it. And we're like, do we want to stick around for the next 10 years? And then the next hurricane wipes us out again. And um, as we started talking about it, my husband was contacted by a business partner of his who said, you know, I have a license in Hawaii. I want someone to go to Hawaii and open this part of our business up. Would you like to go do it? Would you like to try it out? So we said, yes, 100%. We sold our house. We sold, you know, what we had. We, we literally came to Hawaii with a suitcase each. And um, through, it, it was amazing. Like the minute we got here, we all just felt like we were home. We breathe. We were home and it did feel like home. And it was, it was remarkable. And I don't want to feel like, I don't want to painted as like I was like some tourist who came and it was like oh this is where I'm supposed to be it was it was a feeling that I had never felt before where I felt like there were things that I had kind of grasped a little tiny bit in my life and then I got here and the feeling was here and that was what it was the whole time it was this feeling that it was calling to me and making me want to come back and I'd never been here before. I'd never been to Hawaii. I'd never been in the Pacific, even though I traveled a lot in my life. It was mostly through Europe and the Middle East. And 
coming here was the best thing that's ever happened to us. Truly getting rid of the, the three, two house with central air and all the electricity and all the kind of all the, the goodies and, and the, the big stainless steel double door fridge and everything like we, we got rid of everything and we live so simply and so basic now and it's completely changed our lives. And I love it. Like I can never go back to that. And, and how are the kids? Do they love it? They love it. Oh my goodness. So my daughter Rio just started doing Hawaiian canoe class and she Ooh. loves it. So she goes twice a week. Now we live very close to the water to like an, an old fishing village. That's a uh, here in Hawaii and she does the canoe with with all the other kids in the village and um they they just have taken this whole place on a hundred percent and they absolutely love it like it's just been so good for all of us I I understand there's a lot of people who have had past lives here or had past lives in Mu, Amen, Lemuria whatever you want to call it and Mm -hmm. I think this is the lifetime where we start to put that away, to put that anger, pain, the resentment a lot of us might feel for having lost that land or being exposed to the trauma of the end of days of those those lands. And did you ever come across in your um, sessions where you knew that the, there was going to be an ending there? There was something coming to Lemuria where you were thinking about preparing to move people that had relocated from Lemuria to Telos and Mount Shasta. And I was just wondering if you ever came across that in any of your sessions. I have definitely, um, in the sessions, I remember clearly coming across Mount Shasta with, with Sarah and going into some of those lives. The one that I talk about in Christie's past life, I believe that that's where it was, was around Mount Shasta in that oh. area. And I believe that was one of those, one of the survivors uh, or the ancestors of one of the survivors, perhaps they floated, perhaps they were a small colony outpost uh-huh. of Mu that had settled over there. But I also believe that um, very early, now, if you look at one of my earliest past lives that I talk about, I talk about the lifetime of Una a little bit, the, the daughter of the commander in Evie, the, uh-huh. uh, the first child born uh, in, you know, to, of that grouping. Her and her sister I talk about in the first book, um, they are separated in the chasm during an earthquake. And I believe her sister is sent to Mount Shasta and she begins to prepare the, the drilling, the holes. And then later on in a past a lifetime, a little bit further down the line, I'm there again as a being who is digging and we're done. We're, we're just, we're ready to stop digging. We've been doing it for too long because of the, the ice age and I find connections to that area, Mount Shasta, all the time in my sessions, even though I honestly wasn't aware of Mount Shasta before I started doing the sessions with Sarah. It was something that I kind of learned about more and more after the sessions took place. And it's enlightening to see what goes on there. Are you, uh, do you visit quite often? Are you uh, familiar with I'm I'm very familiar with Mount Shasta. I have a a dear friend that lives there and I've been there many times. So Telos is a um, interdimensional city and they have galactic meetings there. Yes, that's what I saw in the sessions. Yeah. These meetings where people, beings, people, whatever it was, they would converge and they would share their information. They would share their technology. They're just everything. And wow. All right. Well, I was just interested because, um, you know, there's so much truth that runs through. I mean, everyone has a slightly different perspective, mm-hmm. but nevertheless, it's our human history. It is. We're piecing it together between all of us trying to, um, you know, see our true ancient history, what it is. Exactly. It's gone way beyond just us feeling it and us, us like kind of feeling like we need to ex- explain to others it. I feel that people are becoming so much more awake to this understanding of what is most likely the most possible scenario of where we've come from and how we develop so differently than other species and why we've advanced in certain ways. And th- there's just so much more evidence that is showing up in right. Daily, that it's kind of 
hard to look at the old mainstream viewpoint anymore and even take it seriously. Yeah. It's an important thing to start remembering for all of us to start looking at what's beyond what everybody wants you to kind of know and start looking at like your memories, looking at your dreams, looking at all the pieces and starting to piece them together for yourself. I know I'm not alone in this. I know there's so many people out there that even every day are just starting to wake up a little bit more to the reality (laughs) of the reality, right? Right. Even over here, I do a lot of hiking, a lot of like foraging and a lot of looking around at different elements that have been left behind here on this island. And one of the things I think is the most interesting is I took a a journey to find what they had, uh, what they called the bathing pool of the queens, where they would go and they'd give birth. And it's this shallow kind of rock pool that's over by, um, it's called Kale. It's the oldest point of inhabitation by the Hawaiians here in, in Hawaii. And in this rock pool, when it's low tide, you can go and you can touch the petroglyphs and it looks like three sperm. Now, how would an ancient civilization that was only allowed to let their women, their queens give birth in this pool, how did they have that understanding? When that's something we've only, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's not something that translated well back in the 1800s, if it was even that early, but they believe it's much earlier than that. So there's wow. so much around. And then also the double helix and a lot of the petroglyphs as well. How are we understanding that at a time where we didn't understand or they believe we didn't understand what DNA and its abilities and what codes it held. So always interesting to look and see what's just right in front of your face, right? Yeah. I always love to talk to you, Jen, because number one, you've got such a great energy. But um, I just resonate with everything that you you love to talk about. So I really appreciate you taking the time to um, talk about your latest book. I cannot wait to read the next one. Oh, you'll get a copy once it's done. It'll be on its way to you. Definitely. I appreciate it. And and, um, if I get back to Hawaii, I'm hope to be able to look you up definitely i want to take you up the volcano and we'll go pay our respects to the volcano gods and have a good time okay (laughs) all right much love to you and your family thank you you. good luck with your um continued um self-exploration and all these great books you're writing I appreciate it. It's always an adventure and I'm so happy to talk to you as well. Always a good time because you get it. You've been there, you know. Yeah. All right, my dear, you have a great day and we'll talk soon. You as well, April. Have a good day. Bye-bye.